Lord, we're grateful for what you provided for us through your son. We thank you for teaching us your love and giving us the opportunity to experience your joy and your peace that only you provide by faith in what you've done. We thank you for giving us your book to study and for the communion of the saints as we come together and minister to each other, with each other, and learn from your word how we can grow in the knowledge of the truth. Amen. Okay. This morning is part four of a series that we started a month ago now on ambassadors and politics, or the ambassador's point of view on politics. And the unique perspective we're bringing to the table here in our discussion about politics is that we are, first and foremost, ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are members of his body, the body of Christ called the church. And this is a perspective that is unique, I think, to Christianity uh, as a whole, but unique to us as mid ex Pauline dispensationalists because we rightly divide what God is doing today from what he is doing for Israel. Okay? And this is so important when it comes to politics. And so we've been talking about that the last few weeks. And um, the first week, just describing our point of view as ambassadors. The second week, dealing with God's ordained functions for institutions of authority, whether it be government or, or whether it be the church, whether it be family, and what those concern and what the responsibilities and limitations on those things are. And then last week, we dealt with the church responsibility specifically and what our responsibility is as the church in our culture, in the world, and what we're supposed to be doing. And of course, the issue there was preaching and evangelizing God's word and will. We're to see souls saved and saints edified. This is a result of us preaching, communicating truth. And so we bring that to the lesson this morning as we get a little bit more practical this week and next week dealing with how to change our country. So what do we do then as ambassadors to change our country? And so this is a topic that I think is appropriate for this election, but also every election it seems to happen, people have this question, how does we change our country? I was reading um, a few weeks back some commentary and editorials on the political uh, happenings going on, and uh, the joke I put on your outline there was if Hillary and Donald uh, Trump are, are left out to sea, abandoned on a lifeboat, who survives? And the answer would be America, uh, because they're both stranded at sea. Uh, so that was kind of humorous. But many people find themselves disenfranchised or without an option this election season. And, and uh, this may not be the first time that's happened to you, but it is for many other people. And they, a lot of Christianity doesn't see something that they, they can stand behind as representative of who they are. Uh, you say, that's, I've never seen someone representative of who I am. And that may be true as well. Uh, but it's, it's worthy of our consideration about our involvement in government, our involvement in politics, and, and how do we make changes in the world. Uh, Calvinist John Piper, who believes that every tragedy, including Matthew, Hur uh, Hurricane Matthew, is God's fingers in the world, thinks that whomever will be elected will be because God chose him to be elected or her to be elected. So this is what the Calvinist approach is to political elections and involvement. Whatever happens, happens because God is controlling history. And that's the Calvinist perspective. And so he says that both people should drop out of the race. Uh, he's messing with God's sovereign will there, I think. I don't know. But he said they should both drop out of the race because he can't, he can't support either one of them. And uh, I think it's interesting just because we talk today about how to change the country or, or more broadly speaking as ambassadors, the world. And, and one of the things we need to realize is that doctrine matters. As we saw our responsibility last week as the church to preach truth, to preach the gospel, the truth about justice and government, the truth about love and mercy in the family, and the truth about faith in God's word in the church. As it's our responsibility to preach truth as God's revealed it. Uh, we need to understand the importance of doctrine in our civic conversation, our political conversation. You've been given a political position on this planet as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? You represent a foreign entity. Jesus Christ not being here, you see, and you're here representing him. You need to stay on message, know what the message is, know what our goal is, and use the means to get that goal accomplished. And this is, this is a mission that we've been given, and this is what we need to perform. And so this is our political involvement, okay? That the world needs to be changed is evident to everybody, I think. In fact, uh, many politicians every year run on the campaign, or every, every few years, run on the campaign of change. Uh, so President Barack Obama ran on hope and change before. Hope and change, hope and change. He's not the first one to do that. Uh, politicians run on change. Even the incumbent parties run on change because everybody wants things to change. 
It's very rare you find the person who say, well, how do you think we're doing in our country or in the world? Do you think that we should just keep doing what we're doing? And hardly anybody will say, oh, yes, perfect, fine, don't change a thing, we're good. You know, this is the best times and not the worst of times at all. You know, so it's rare you find that person. Everybody wants to change, right? And so when we talk this morning about how to change our country, this sounds provocative because everybody goes, yes, how do we do that? And there's going to be 50, 60 different opinions here this morning. There's going to be Everyone has their own idea of what to change and how to change it. And so when we talk about change, the real question is changing toward what? What's the goal? And how do we accomplish that? What's the means to that goal? And so as we speak about the ambassador's uh, uh, approach to politics, we need to clearly identify what the church's goal is and what is our means of accomplishing it. Can it even happen? What is it we're trying to accomplish in the world? What is God's tools of changing this world? Okay, not the world's tools of changing the world, but God's tools. What's he doing? Can't God do what he wants, as John Piper would believe? Can't he just ordain someone to be the president? Isn't he controlling the ship of our nation? Isn't he controlling the affairs of the world? Or is he not? What is God doing, by the way? Which is the dispensational question. I, I said that a hundred times in the last few months. The dispensational question is asking, what is God doing? Okay, so the world needs to change. What we know doctrinally is that Galatians 1 verse 4 says we live in a present evil world. And so when we open the scriptures in what Paul describes this world to be like, he says that there's a God of this world that would try to blind people's minds to the glorious gospel, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 and 4. He says that Christ was, came to save us from our sins and deliver us from this present evil world. And that's a truth that we have to acknowledge. We have to acknowledge that we need to change us personally, but our country and the world itself. The whole world, in fact, has been given up in sin, right? This, this seems standard fare for Christianity. As we come here, we acknowledge our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. But do you apply this to the change in your culture? Because it has a grave effect, okay? The change in politics, the change in your country. The doctrine that we live in a present evil world will change the way you pursue change in the world. You understand? If you think we're not living in an evil world, and as I just uh, heard an interview from Edward Snowden the other day, and he was talking about how people in the government are typically good-intentioned. You know, people are generally good. And I thought, that's a doctrinal difference between him and I. I mean, yeah, I, I, I shake hands with my neighbors, and people are nice, but the Bible tells me there's none righteous, no, not one. And the Bible tells me, and Jeremy articulated this morning, that the book of Corinthians tells me that people will pursue their flesh desires more frequently then they will God's will. And this is just the course of nature, human nature, you see. This is what the Bible describes. It takes some study to show ourselves approved. It takes some work, some effort, some choice to say, I'm going to walk in the Spirit. Right? This is what doctrine teaches me. And so when I read that we live in a present evil world because the world's filled with sinners who've rejected God for two, thousands of years and Jesus Christ for a couple of those thousand, you know, this changes the way I view and perceive everything. Okay. And we'll see there's many doctrines like this that we find in the scripture about what God's doing today that affect how we change our country. Okay. Even God wants to change the world. You know, people look at politics and they understand there's liberals, there's conservatives, there's the centrists, you know, and there's this spectrum of politics, right? And, uh, you know, if liberal meant more liberty, I'm all for it, which is, is, is an old-fashioned definition of it. If liberal meant more uh, openness to change. I'm for it, because I want things to change, right? If conservative meant don't change, I don't want no, no change, I want change. But if conservative means we're going to stand on old-fashioned truths like this book, then yeah, I'm for that. And so I bring that as an illustration that it's not about political conservative liberal, it's about God's word and what aligns with it, you see. So it's not about belonging to one party or another. It's about what God would have done. And God will that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Right? Well, where do we find truth? Is it from the television? Is it from Bloomberg? Is it from the news sources you read? Whatever it is. Where do you get truth? Well, everyone in church knows you get truth from the Bible. I mean, this is an easy question. But then we walk out of the church and go, well, I'm going to get truth from somewhere else. Why don't you take this knowledge of truth and apply it in your life? in the way you perceive the world. 
And that's what we're trying to do with this, this series here, is, is help you take the knowledge of the truth of who you are in Christ, your position as an ambassador, and the knowledge of what God is doing and how humanity has responded to him, and use us to analyze and evaluate and apply it to the events going on. Okay? God will have all men to be changed. The verse says all men to be saved, but saved means what? You're going to be saved from your sin. You're going to be saved from death. Your mind's going to be changed to the reality of Jesus Christ dying for your sins and the need for a Savior, the belief in resurrection, the, the belief in a new creature, the doctrines of grace. You're going to learn things. Okay, spiritual truths. You're going to change in your understanding, hopefully grow in your understanding. Okay. Philippians 3.21 says that our vile bodies will be changed. It says our conversation is in heaven. And so again, God has in his purpose a change for you. You're going to be resurrected. That's going to happen sometime in the future. Until then, God has a purpose, an agenda to play out. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, doesn't Paul talk about our transforming our minds? Right? The transformation of our minds in Romans 12, 2. The renewing of our minds. And so if God's will is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, doesn't that mean we need people to change? If we're out there preaching, nobody should change, we're good just as we are, which is a hymn, just as you are, right? It's not just as you are, just as I am. God wants you to be in him and be conformed to his image, you see. So when you get the gospel, you've already changed your thinking, believing Christ for salvation, leaving his finished work for salvation. And then you have more things to learn and change in your mind. You're constantly changing to be conformed to the image of Christ. That is the life of a Christian. Okay? Why do we think it would be any different in the world? You see, they're not even saved, most of them. You see, so this is things we need to understand. God wants all men to be changed, to be saved, to grow in the knowledge of the truth. Paul prays for this, and we ought to as well. But changing toward what end? By what means do we accomplish change? Is the political question. Can we change anything? Many people have a hopeless kind of idea and say, well, we just can't change anything. It's, it's, a, it's, it's all vanity. Is this true? Is it hopeless? Are we just here just, you know, tilting at windmills? Don Quixote, right? And saying, well, we're trying to do change, but nothing's ever going to happen. Is there any hope at all? Is God's purpose, is this something that actually works? Or is it just something that, yeah, that's religious and pious sounding, but it's not something that I can actually believe in. It's not something I can get half the country to back. You know, it's this idea of preaching Christ and him crucified. I'll water it down a bit. You know, general social acceptable religion. Which is, isn't that what the WikiLeaks email said about the Catholic religions? It was a socially acceptable, right? That the most socially acceptable religion was Catholicism, conservatively. Right? That's what it said. Which means mid acts Pauline, Bible-believing dispensationalism, not socially acceptable. Not. Right? I believe every word of this book. I believe Christ and him crucified changes people's souls. Not, not acceptable when you're out fundraising. You see, it's not, it's not something that you have on your plank of your party. But that's our party, folks. This is our, our ambassadorship. This is our head giving us commands. So when we talk about how do we change the world, what's our goal, what's the means that we accomplish the goal, the question surrounds doctrine, the importance of it. And where do you find true doctrine? Verse 23, verse 15. The church should be the pillar and the ground of the truth. Not because people in the church are smarter, not because you all have all the answers and no one else outside these walls doesn't have the answers, it's because of this book. This is truth. God's revealed word is truth. And more specifically, this book rightly divided. As we'll see here, there are many people who claim just what I said, right? We're Christians, we want to do God's will in our country, in our world, and they use the Bible even, and they use different parts of the Bible in different contexts, and we have different political ends and means, right? So I need to be more specific, don't I? But doctrine comes from the church. Science can't tell us what is true, only what is, okay? Entertainment, comedians can't tell us what is true. They can only mock what isn't. <laughs> You see, what is true comes from God and God's word. And this is something you only know by faith in the scripture. You see, and so we need as the church to, to stand, to take an offensive position, to be able to communicate this message. Because the world needs to hear it, right? Whether they follow it or not, or believe it, or whether they hear it or receive it or not, it's not your issue. God wants you to be the one waving the banner of this message. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. And there will be fruit from this. There will be profit. There will be a goal that is met. The goal of seeing souls saved and saints edified. 
Now, if your goal is different, you're going to be disappointed. But if your goal is seeing souls saved and saints edified, this works. Okay? And that's what will change our world, change people, change our country. Okay? So what is our end? What is the goal that we're trying to accomplish here? And uh, this, again, is something you need to be privy to because uh, the political debates, the political battles, the, the politics of the world, um, they all have a different agenda. You see? You bring something to the table as well. People are divided over the end goal. Not just world versus Christians, but Christians versus Christians are divided about the goal. We need to know what God's goal, what does our head say to us about what we ought to be accomplishing? You ask the world, well, what is the purpose of electing so-and-so or electing this person here? What, what, are they, what are they trying to accomplish, really? Okay, I mean, there's been so much personal attacks and carnal behavior going on in this election especially. What is the goal of all this? I mean, what does the president actually do? And apart from the president, aren't there senators and congressmen being elected to positions? And aren't there other questions that, that we're dealing with? I mean, are we talking about the issues at all? Or is it just a celebrity match where people are voting like Survivor and who they like least or like most and vote them off the island, right? Is this what it is? The ultimate reality show? Just entertainment? In which case, let's not participate. What's the point of that? Right? Is the, what's the end goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? People will say in the world, philosophers have said, well, we're trying to maximize happiness. You know, make the most people happy. And this is the idea of democracy, right? The democ democratic idea is that we're going to have a majority vote to try to make the most people happy. Give them what they want. Right? You know, maybe I'm becoming a political blasphemer here, but um, is that really what God wants us to do? Is that the goal? The, the, the most people to be happy, as much, to maximize happiness and pleasure? This is what we're supposed to be doing? No. I mean, this, again, in church, this is a simple question, simple answer. No, of course not. We'd preach the gospel. Amen, amen. You go outside the church, oh yeah, we just want to be happy. Whatever makes us comfortable, you know. Hmm? Who would vote for someone that makes their life more miserable? Right? Oh, did you trust Christ for salvation? Do you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? As Ray pointed out, won't that mean you'll face suffering? Why'd you make that choice? Hmm? Was it to maximize your pleasure and happiness? If you got saved to maximize your pleasure and happiness, you got saved for the wrong reason. I'll tell you that. Ultimately, there'll be all glory and righteousness and peace and joy and eternity and in heaven and places and on earth, but not now. Now your responsibility is to preach the gospel. Now you live in a present evil world. You to be a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, is socially unacceptable. Right? You understand that? And so to go outside, as we say, we're involved in politics and just take a stand on the truth, that's not the conversation that's happening, you see. And you're in a minority, folks. You're in a minority. The political debates, uh, every day there's a new poll on who's in the lead and this sort of thing, right? And it's always 50, 50 percent. There's a reason for that. We'll talk about it next week. But it's always 50-50%, right? Do you really think it's 50-50% on people that are on your side? 50% of the country on either side? Is it, are there Bible-believing Christians that are trying to do God's will and the other one's the devil? You know, and is this really what's going on? You see, there's a battle that needs to be fought and nobody's fighting it. This is where you come in. You're supposed to be fighting a battle nobody else is fighting. A battle based on God's will, His goal, by His means. Trying to maximize happiness is an exercise in vanity. Okay? If this is the goal of your life, you'll find it empty, temporary. You'll, you'll be able to be happy from time to time, maybe even for long stretches of time, right? But it'll be hollow, okay? This is the message of Christianity. That there's our, there are eternal truths. There's an eternal peace. There's an eternal uh, joy you have in God through Christ, through salvation, okay? The maximizing happiness is an exercise in vanity, as is seeking prosperity, Again, in the church walls, we speak often in our Bible-believing church here, in our dispensational church here, uh, about the errors and the dangers of prosperity preaching in church. The idea that if you give you know, and sow your seed of atonement, as I heard a couple weeks ago, to Rod Parsley in Ohio, he will return to you a hundredfold. God will, not Rod Parsley, obviously. Right? Because God uh, is unlimited in resources. Rod Parsley needs more. So, yeah, you sow your, your love gift your seed gift, financial seed gift, and he will return tenfold to you. The message of prosperity. And, and don't you understand, don't we have the, the doctrinal knowledge just to that degree to say that there's something wrong with that? Even though we can find that sort of doctrine in Israel's teaching, it's not for today. And that's fraudulent. Don't we see the fraudulence in that? Certainly, right? People are just trying to pursue prosperity. Doesn't God have a perfect plan for your life? 
Doesn't God want you to prosper and be successful? Right? And so in our world, are we trying to seek prosperity and success? And so who we elect or who we vote for or what we're supporting, the message we're trying to defend is physical prosperity? Well, just like physical pleasure is something that you, you, it'd be vain, a vain pursuit, so is physical prosperity is a vain pursuit. Again, in church culture, this is accepted. You know, we don't pursue money, we pursue God. And then we leave the, the, the church building and we pursue money. Right? Because this is spiritual, but we live in a physical world, so we need physical things, so we pursue the money as the end goal. Right? Why do they debate economics and fiscal policy in government? What's wrong with having a deficit? What is the GDP, after all? How rich are we in America? Which presidential candidate or which bureaucracy or administration is going to make America more prosperous? Is this our end goal? Think about it. Is the goal in our country to be the richest country in the world and to maintain that level of wealth? Who wouldn't like to be rich? Anybody want to be rich? I would like to be rich. I don't know about you. I would love to be rich. Um, it, you all can sit there and be pies if you want. I, I would love to have money. Okay. And so when someone tells me, you vote for me, I'll get you more money, I'm going, hmm, that sounds pretty good. Right? Done it to you? But this one I'm trying to do is challenge our thinking and evaluate our perspective on what if there was, and this is a big what if, there were two candidates. One said, I can make you rich, and the other one said, I can make you righteous. Would you like to live in a righteous country or a rich country? That's an interesting thought experiment. Right? So your country is one of the poorest in the world, but you're all Christian. Or you're one of the wealthiest countries in the world, living in the country we live in now. <laughs> but we're not. Which one would you rather? Now, that's a real test on your spirit and your flesh, isn't it? As you're going, wow, we're pretty comfortable now in America, and being wealthy would be great. So now you've got a choice to make about spirit and flesh, right? Physical, that sort of thing. Th this is the kind of thinking we need to bring to the table. And again, I'm not saying we, we divest ourselves of money for the sake of monastic living. But just thinking of what our priorities, what is the end goal? What are we trying to do? in our church, in our family, in our country, in our society? What is the goal here? Okay. The world has its own goal. As I mentioned things about God and eternal things, the world does not have that as their goal. You see, they've rejected it. They ignore it. They don't care. Right? And you know what that's like because you didn't either before you learned the truth. And so understand the, the goal of the politics of the day is not the same goal as yours. Okay? So I'm a conservative, been a Republican my whole life, or whatever. You, know, you don't have the same goals as them, you understand. They have their agenda, your goals are different. Perhaps you find yourself bumping into them on certain positions, but you have a different goal. That should be the reality that we face. And our goal is dependent on Bible doctrine. Okay. People talk about doctrine all the time, except in churches exactly where doctrine needs to be taught. Okay. The church should be the pillar and the ground of the truth, but when you turn on CNN, you turn on you know, MSNBC or Fox or whatever you, you watch on television, whenever you, you turn on uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the news websites you visit, okay, the feeds that you, you, you get your news resources from, there's doctrine being thrown at you all the time. Doctrine, 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 doctrine. They don't call it doctrine. I mean, this is kind of an old-fashioned biblical type of word, but Ideas, teachings, beliefs, positions, presumptions. Okay? The, the premise to their thinking, the way they view the world is being thrown at you all the time. Okay? And if you do not combat that with sound doctrine from God's words, you will be affected by it because people are taught what they hear and they swallow it unless you have a shield of faith, a defense, knowing true doctrine. You see? So you are all products of the culture being teaching you doctrine, and your parents teaching you doctrine, and your friends teaching you doctrine, things you watch on TV teaching you doctrine, things on the internet teaching you doctrine, swaying your opinions, influencing your ideas, right? How do you change our country? With right doctrine, true doctrine, sound doctrine, you see. It's not just doctrine. Everybody teaches doctrine. You've got to get the doctrine right, you see. This is why we need the Bible rightly divided. This is why we need sound, sound doctrine. Doctrine's heard everywhere. And you understand conservative doctrine. The Republican Party has their plank. Liberal doctrine. The Democratic Party has their planks. Right? We know the, the centrist doctrine, the mainstream doctrine, the, the non-interventionist doctrine. There's all sorts of political doctrines. And which one describes you? Hmm? As an ambassador of Jesus Christ. 
Well, this book does, right here. We're fighting a warfare, folks. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Jeremy brought up the verse in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, earlier this morning, where he said that we should forgive one another and we ought to be gracious towards one another, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of the devils, of Satan's devices, to get an advantage of us. There is a warfare going on, a spiritual warfare, that no one is privy to unless you're alive spiritually between God's truth and the devil's lies. Okay? This is the spiritual warfare. And if you're not careful, Satan can get an advantage by corrupting, distorting, hiding uh, right doctrine. Okay? Preventing you, distracting you from speaking and communicating right doctrine. And what is the political debates except for a distraction of you not teaching right doctrine? Why is it they get to frame the questions? Right? How come you're not framing the question? Well, you say there's not enough of us. I understand that, but someone's got to speak out, is what I'm trying to say. You see, don't accept the questions the world says is important. You've got to ask the Bible what God says is important, what the questions are it asks. And it's, the Bible's answers to those questions are what affect your views, your perspectives, your tools of change. Okay? And we'll see that what happens is real change. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 3. Paul says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That's a doctrine right there. In the church, okay, the church's responsibility is not to bear the sword. The government's responsibility is to bear the sword. It's not the church's responsibility for us to get our guns and go fight the Methodists down the road in a little scrimmage, you know, see who last man standing. That's not the church's tool, <laughs> We live and walk after the flesh, don't we? We're here, we're in a country, we're in a world, we have necessities, we've got to eat, we've got to live, there's got to be rules, there's family, there's authorities, we've already described those. We live and walk in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. Our warfare, which is a warfare by the way, folks, we're in a battle, okay? It's not, it's not complacency, again, as, as the Corinthians had the problem, but it's a warfare, and our weapons, of verse 4, are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Do you believe that, or is that just a good bookmark verse? I mean, that sounds great. Put it on a music video, right? Hooray, our God's greater than your God, right? Or do we actually believe that's true? That the weapons of warfare that God has provided for us, which are described in Ephesians 6, are mighty to pulling down of strongholds? But Justin, you sound like a kingdom preacher here. If we had right doctrine, we can, we can go down to the White House and we can knock down those strongholds, right? We can break through the barriers of communication. Well, what, what are the strongholds here? What is being held strongly by the enemy? Look at verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What is being held by the bonds of the enemy? Imaginations, thoughts, knowledge of God. What people think about God, what people know to be true, what people imagine as their dream and end goal. It's vanity. It's wrong. It's being corrupted and distorted by all of the other influences of the world, the devil, the sin, and flesh in the world. Right? We have a message of truth to preach to people, to deliver them from the bonds of what that, that they've been taught wrongly. Okay? The strongholds of their mind of their soul. What you preach can set people free. Their spirits free. Their soul will be saved. Okay. When you save someone's soul, um, it does not deliver them from any sort of financial bondage that they're in. People have financial debt and you preach the gospel to them. They go, I'm still in debt. <laughs> Christ paid all your sins. Your debt is paid for. Not the one the bank has, you know. Right? Christ will not get rid of our country's debt. <laughs> well, then what's the point of Christ? Right? If he's not going to do that. What's the point of Christ if he can't provide free health care? Well, he did once. Right? <laughs> there is an ideology in Christianity that says since Christ did it, we should do. That sounds Christian, doesn't it? Christ provided free health care, folks. Didn't he? Everywhere he went. 
Sick, healed, sick, healed, sick, healed. Did he charge for that? No. And that is the argument that Christians hold politically from the Bible for that sort of thing. Now, there's other arguments as well, you know, politically and practically and that sort of thing. But they'll use the scripture and say, Jesus provided it. Jesus loved the sick. We should as well. There's a dispensational problem here. One, you're not Jesus. Two, when Jesus did that, he was preaching the kingdom on earth. You're not preaching the kingdom on earth, are you? Well, see, therein is the problem. Doctrine affects our approach to politics, you see. So we need to, to understand that. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, or 4 says we, are, we have weapons to use in a warfare. Down in verse 13 says, We will not boast of the things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. And so what Paul says there in verse 13 is that he's going to boast, he's going to preach, he's going to stand and fight with the measure that God's given us to fight with. He's going to limit himself to what God has told him to do. To the bounds in which God has given me to minister. Right? God has not told us in this dispensation to bring in the kingdom with canons. This is not the preaching of the church. But you can find in the Bible where God told people to do that. Okay? Joel chapter 3, for example, in verse 10. Beat your plowshares into, into swords and go fight the war. All right? Tear down the enemies power structures. And there is a militant instruction from God in the scripture. Because we understand when you open the Bible up, it doesn't always say the same thing to every person, right? We know the Bible is revealed progressively uh, throughout history and that since the beginning of the world when God promised to Abraham, the initial father of Israel, that he would have a nation above the nations and a kingdom on the earth to have dominion on this planet, he said, I'm going to give you rule over a segment of the earth, and you're going to rule over the other nations on this planet. Okay, here's this kingdom here. There we go. He's going to rule over the other nations, right? He creates a nation called Israel. We'll put their nation right here. Made up of 12 tribes, and gives them a law. And they operate for about five or 600 years, until prophets come, like John the Baptist, who start preaching that this kingdom of God is at hand in Matthew chapter 3. You've seen this chart a hundred times before. He starts pre preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus Christ comes preaching himself as the king. And the kingdom comes. Starts giving instructions in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about how to operate in this kingdom. How to live in this kingdom. Right? That king dies on the cross. That king goes to heaven. Christ says, well, I'm gone. Keep doing the work. Right? Are we living in the kingdom now? This is the doctrinal, biblical, dispensational question that Christians dispute. And it has a tremendous effect on how we view the world, in politics in particular. Because when we ask, what is God doing? What does God want us to do? Well, if God is doing this over here, if God is doing this, then we need to set something up. We need to find a city, find a hill, put that city on the hill. We need to shine a light to the other nations of the world because we're a Christian nation. Right? That would be the goal. But what if we're not living there? Because, you know, the Bible talked about before that kingdom come, there'd be a time of tribulation and judgment. This is flames of fire and vengeance. Destruction and death. And so all the, the evil kingdoms of this world are tore down before the God says what's kingdom, right? The Bible teaches this. What if we live here? What are we to do? Run and hide. All right, I mean, you're in tribulation. I mean, it's time for judgment. So I'm going to find a cave somewhere, and uh, you're going to get destroyed. Good luck, world. Right? This is why we see all the, pro the unemployment in our, in our country today is because of the times of tribulation. Signs of the times. Right? God's judging America. Where do you think that idea comes from? Thinking we live here. What's missing from the chart? Those of you who have been here quite well know that there's something drastically missing from the chart, which is after Christ's resurrection, before the tribulation came, and I, and I have to squeeze it in here now, there was a message revealed to an apostle, Paul. A message of grace. 
what Paul calls a dispensation of grace, a responsibility, a message, an operation that God says, now I'm operating in the world, not according to tribulation or according to kingdom. I'm not preaching that. I'm preaching a dispensation, an operation of grace in this world. Before I judge them, I'm going to offer them grace, free grace. Before I bring my soldiers to the earth and destroy all of their ambitions, I'm going to offer them grace. Save them by grace. And so I, Paul, in the timeline, is saved right here, you know, before the tribulation here. Okay, at least without it. And this is the message we find in Paul's epistles, the operation of God according to grace. And if you think we're operating this way, you think it'll change the way we view what God is doing in the world? Or what we ought to be doing in the world? Then it should. Okay. Is our goal to conquer and rule the world? There are people who say so. We can find Bible verses that say so. Or is our goal today to save and to serve. Obviously, we covered 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, God's will is that all men be saved, come to knowledge of the truth. Salvation and growing in knowledge of the truth looks different than this. You understand? It looks different than that. Is our goal to be in power or to preach the power of God unto salvation? What's our, what's our means? What's our, what's our end goal here? Because if our goal is to be in power, we need to do something different than if our goal is to preach with power the gospel. If our goal is to be in power, it doesn't matter who hears the gospel. It doesn't matter if they're saved or not. If your guy's in office, we got a lever, right? If your guy's sitting there and has a position of authority, we can pass the bill. We can control things. We can have real change happen, right? According to what? Change according to what? It's not according to God's will. Right? How do we change our country? People say we need to get people in positions of power and this is how politics works. This is how the political game works. Anybody heard of, what's his name? Chris Jankowski? I think it's his name, Chris Jankowski? No? Republican State, uh, was it the Republican State uh, uh, Liberty Committee or something like this? I forget what it is. But in 2010, I'm, I'm going to show my nerdiness here apparently. In 2010, he was in charge of a project called Red Map. Anybody heard of that? What are you doing voting in this election? You know, <laughs> we'll talk about this next week. Anybody heard of? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find common ground here this morning. Anybody ever heard of gridlock? Political gridlock. You know what this is? In our country, we don't send under a king, right? We send under there's a president. And there's other, two other branches of government. There's the legislative branch, then there's the judicial branch, right? In our country. Not all the countries have that. But the president is not a king. Now, how much they want to be a king, they're not a king. Okay, they can't do anything they want, right? They must get agreement with Congress to pass laws and things like this. They have to agree. And so if the Congress is red and the president is blue or vice versa, what happens is the red people, they want something done, and the blue guy president says, nope. Or the blue guy wants something done, and the red people say, nope. Gridlock. Does anything happen? Nope. <laughs> Does change occur? Nope. But this is the political game. And so what do you do if you're in the politics of the world? You get in positions of power, and, and you, get, you get more seats in the Congress, and you get more people on, on the judicial uh, the, the board, you know, the, the, the judiciary and the Supreme Court, more seats on the court, right? Because you know if you get another seat on the Supreme Court, we haven't yet got one on the Supreme Court, so now there's, there's even, there, there's not a person to break the tie. Then we can have uh, laws and agendas pushed on our country for the next who knows how long, right? No matter if people want it or not, no matter if it's true or not, we'll get our agenda pushed. Right? There's been a few times in American history where, again, I'm getting ahead of myself talking about this next week. You know your vote doesn't vote for president. You know that, right? You vote for what's called electors. They vote for president. And multiple times, most recently, I think in 2000, or maybe one a little sooner, where the popular vote was different than who actually got the office. You understand this? And these are just the details of our political imaginations that you have to be privy to if you're going to play the political game. What I'm trying to say is that perhaps the game you ought to be playing is not that. Right? We say, well, how do we affect change in the world if not through the political structure? Right? 
well, we have a message to preach, which should happen 365 days a year, every year, not just every two years, every four years. Right? This is how change happens in people's souls. Change doesn't happen doctrinally. If we want to change people in the church, how should we do this? Should I mandate to all of you that you ought to, you're going to do this, the new law in the church, Grace Ambassador's Law, you will wear two ties every Sunday, you know. This is the new law. Is this going to change you? It's not going to change you. We know this doctrine. It's a simple, silly example. The law doesn't change people. It condemns people. Right? So if we pass a law to ban abortion, is this going to change people who want to kill their babies? It's going, to, it's going to prevent people from killing their babies. Maybe some. Right? Or any other example. We know something doctrinally about how people operate in a present evil world. Sinful people. That you cannot change sinful people's desires and wills based on imposing them a law. They've got to change the inside out. How do you change someone from the inside out? Oh, the gospel does this. The gospel of Jesus Christ changes people from the inside out. And this is what God has given us as a tool to effect change in the world. That's where you see real change. Okay. That's where you see change to the right end. Liberation theology, which is what Jeremiah Wright, Barack Obama's pastor, at least for a little while, taught in his church in Chicago, is the theology that we're to be delivered from all social oppression and injustice. That's what liberation theology teaches. Liberation theology is a theology, it's not dispensational theology, it's not literal Bible belief theology, it's a theology that teaches that we are oppressed uh, and a minority and we're facing injustices and we need to be delivered and fight for this. This is theology taught in churches, folks. Where do they get this idea in, in, in the Bible? Is it anywhere in the Bible where there's God's people that are oppressed by the majority in the, in the institutions of the world? Yeah. I mean, Israel, the book of Exodus... They were slaves, and they were God's people. And what did Pharaoh do? He oppressed them, right? But what did the people do? They cried out to be delivered, and a deliverer came and delivered them. So he's like Moses, right? Moses comes, and this is liberation theology. It comes from the Bible, wrongly divided, and it's held by some churches as the way they operate in the world, as, as, as explaining what God is doing today. He's trying to deliver you from injustice. And so we have social justice warriors today. Where does this idea come from? For eight years, we've had an administration influenced by liberation theology. And people don't even talk about liberation theology. They talk about politics. You said there's a doctrinal undergirding to these things. There's a doctrinal undergirding to people thinking that I'm being oppressed and facing injustices instead of being thankful, gracious, and considering God's will in their life. There's a different approach. We talked about entitlement last week and how the Bible speaks against entitlement because grace says that you don't deserve anything. Right? Grace doctrine affects the way we think. Doctrine affects your behavior. Doctrine affects your politics. Kingdom dominion or reconstruction theology. Ever heard of kingdom dominion theology? This is very popular in evangelical circles today. Crossing over various different denominations and things. But Rusas Rushduni wrote uh, many books talking about homeschooling and, and uh, taking back the the mountains of society and how God's word applies to every area of life. And so we need to use the law and put that in our government, to put biblical law into, God's, into our government so that we operate according to God's laws. And so you know, advocating the Ten Commandments as being the laws of our country. Okay, 613 points of law. Their agenda, based on Genesis 1.28, is to take back dominion of the earth. God told Adam to have dominion over the planet. All right, Genesis 1.28. He told Abe to have dominion on the earth. Well, this is their theology. Theology is that that's what we're to do. When Christ came and John the Baptist came, didn't they teach the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of Christ being the king ruling on the planet? And so the theology, if you think that we're living here, if you think we're living under Adam's mandate in the garden to have dominion on the planet, this is what we ought to be doing as the church, as Christians. We ought to be seeing how we can conquer this world. So we can put a Christian in positions of power. So we can get a, 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 the Christian principles it's no longer about the cross and, and the salvation from sin. Now it's about conquering the planet, which is what Christ will do, right? He's going to conquer the planet. He's going to set up his kingdom. And so we're trying to build the Christian kingdom on earth. This is the theology. Matthew chapter 6 is taken from there. Anyone heard of the social gospel? The social gospel is something created in the 1800s where churches said, we're going to save the world the way Christ taught to save it. Matthew chapter 6, Matthew 23. To do to the least of these, to help the poor. And that's how you'll conquer the world. 
right? Well, these, these are all doctrines that affect what you think our goal is, what you think the means are to, to accomplish it. I've already talked about tribulation now, where people look for signs of the times, and their response to the world is to run and hide, to look out for Christ. Signs of the times, Christ is coming. Matthew 24, Jesus said there'll be signs of his return. And there'll be rumors of wars and all sorts of tragedies and disasters. When people think they're living in Matthew 23, they'll look for that, and that affects the way they get involved. In fact, they will, won't often get involved at all. And so the criticism against some dispensational theology is that dispensationalism teaches you don't get involved at all. Because you're just looking for the world to go get burned up, waiting for Christ to come back and rescue you, and so you're not doing anything. Yeah, that's Acts 2 dispensationalism. Because Acts 2 is where Peter preaches the last days in the tribulation. You say, what's it matter if you're mid-Acts or Acts 2 or Acts 20? It matters greatly. Because if you're Acts 2 and you're preaching at Pentecost, you're preaching tribulation last days doctrine. If you're mid-Acts, you're not living the last days of the tribulation, which means that you are in the world, you have a message to preach to the world, and it's not God's judgment. So you're no longer afraid of this world. You have a position to minister in it. You see? That's the difference between mid-Acts and Acts 2 doctrine. Grace doctrine and tribulation last days kingdom doctrine. Your doctrine affects the way you see the world. Okay? Grace doctrine doesn't say we're to conquer for Christ. It doesn't say we're under social oppression and we're to, to, to deliver ourselves from the injustices. It doesn't say that we're to look out for Christ, run and hide because the devil's going to destroy everything, the Antichrist is coming. The grace doctrine teaches this, that God is offering salvation freely to all today. Not all will receive it, but some will. That's what grace doctrine teaches. Okay? We're not pie in the sky. We're not naive and saying, well, grace doctrine, we're to save everybody, and everybody's going to be saved. You think that's going to happen? People say it's never going to happen. We're hopeless. No, you're not hopeless. Because there are people who will be saved. We know the whole world won't be saved. Because you go preach to people, I preach to people, and they reject it. Okay? There are, Michael Weinstein, the president of the, the, the Military Religious Freedom Foundation or whatever, he will not be saved, as far as I can tell. He will not. He can be, but he will not. He <laughs> doesn't want to be, you see. And so I'm naive to think that everybody's going to be saved. But can everybody be saved? Yes. And will people be saved? Yes. And those people will be saved for eternity, and their souls will be changed. They'll change the way they think, and they have an opportunity to be growing in the knowledge of the truth. And how does that happen as a result? Of preaching of teaching, of the church taking a stand on God's will and word is. Right? 1 Corinthians 9.22, Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might save some. That's not a man who's hopeless. That's a man who's filled with hope. I become all things to all men that I may save some because those some that are saved matter, make all the difference. Right? That's our message of grace. That's our involvement. Say, what's our goal in politics? Our goal is that we pray that there be, we can experience peace and quiet so that we can live our ministry and our lives and godliness and honesty, that we can do God's will to see souls saved and saints edified. Right? That's our involvement. We preach the doctrine of the scripture, and what we've seen in culture is that typically there has never been a Bible believing president in America. A Bible believing mid Acts Paul. There's never been, folks. And I, I can go on a limb and say there will never will be. <laughs> All right? You are a minority. You always have been a minority. We need to get over it. You're not going to win by majority vote. Never going to happen. The only way you win by majority vote is if you compromise your doctrines. You water them down too much, so much to a degree that the world agrees with you. That's the only way it's going to happen. But you know what you do have is the power of change in people's lives. The real power of change. Because people can have the lowest taxes on earth, they can have the, the highest welfare on earth, and it will not change their life, their soul, the peace that they need, the, the, the truth that they're looking for. It will not answer their questions. Okay? It'll give them a handout. Right? It'll give them a free ride. It'll give them a pass in this life, or what they really need is a future. Right? What they need is salvation. This is where orientation should be. Paul says, I, I desire to save some. He does all things to the glory of God. Romans 8, 28 says, All things work together for good to those that love God, uh, who, who, according to his purpose, is what he says. According to God's purpose. It doesn't say all things work together for good in the next election, no matter what. 
What if God's purpose was not for America to be the richest country in the world? What if God's purpose didn't involve America, but it involved the church, the body of Christ? And man, our country, it's going down. <laughs> you don't have the spirit of fear, folks, because there are Christians not only in America, but in Mexico and in Brazil and in China and in Pakistan. There are Christians across the world. And what's their hope? They don't have a democratic system. When one branch of their government goes out of control, there's not another one to check it. Right? What do they do? There's no gridlock in their country. There's dictators. Right? What are they to do? They, do, they preach grace doctrine, the same thing that you do. They have encouragement, they have hope, they have peace in Christ. Knowing that where they suffer in the flesh, they can rejoice in resurrection. They can rejoice in the spirit. Right? They can rejoice in knowing the truth. There's a peace that passes understanding according to Ephesians chapter 3 and Philippians chapter 4. It's a peace that passes this election. <laughs> okay. Our means are different than the world. I read this last week there in Colorado there are dead people voting. You hear that? And I, I read another place in New Jersey where a dead person was elected. That's even better. <laughs> he died like 30 days before the, you know, the outcome and he still got the vote. So he's in, but he's dead. I read that. I was like, that's, that's kind of funny, but at the same time, you know, we really need more, peop more dead people voting and holding office. And by that I mean Romans 6. You know what I'm talking about, right? Romans 6, reckon yourself dead. We had more dead people voting, voting dead to their flesh and not according to their flesh. If we had more dead people holding positions or more dead people operating in the world generally, crucified in Christ, you would be much better off. That's just how I saw the news headline. I was like, what do I care? You know, they, they register some dead people. Oh, that's crazy. There's 30 million voters anyway. But if more people operate in their life, crucified in their flesh, that'd be a good thing. That'd be the good means to an end. We're just trying to bring in Christ's kingdom on the earth. And so we're going to use all sorts of political means to do it. Worldly political means. We're going to lie, cheat, steal, deceive in order to do this. We're going to be greedy in order to do this. We're going to sin so that Christ can be preached. You know, that's not what God wants. The means needs to match the ends. We studied this last week on Tuesday, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul tells Timothy that one of the most important things in church ministry and in your life personally is a good conscience. And this is what, maybe why you're having cognitive dissonance this election season. Maybe, maybe this is why you have election stress disorder, as the psychiatrists say, is that you're, you're seeing that you cannot vote in good conscience. You know? Well, may, maybe you can't vote in good conscience. You should stand for a good conscience. Right? We need more of that in the world. Paul says, in church ministry, the pillar and the God of the truth should be established on a good conscience. Doing all that you do in a good conscience. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul very clearly lists our means of change in the world. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. This should be encouraging, folks, because if you have faith, at least, we realize this is the truth of the matter. This is the sum of it. You say, I don't know much about fiscal policy or economic policy or foreign policy. or Those things are beyond me. Okay. Well, God wants you to know one thing, the truth of God's rightly divided. God does understand those things you know. He, does, he, he is not ignorant of what's going on in the world. God knows what will be, what has been, what is happening, and what God has told you to do today is right here. Some Christians, I think, have the idea that, you know, God wrote this book 2,000 years ago, but he really didn't anticipate this. And so we have better technology, better science, better academics. We know better in a way God knew. You know. Well, you've got to get to the point that you let God be true and every man a liar so that what God said needs to be done is what needs to be done. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, Paul says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. This message this morning is rejected by political strategists around the world because it's foolish. It's not going to work. We can't get majority vote positions of power by preaching the cross. <laughs> we need to do something else. We need to get a moral majority. <laughs> Hmm? We get a moral majority. <laughs> That's what they did for a while. So you became the minority. <laughs> now it's the immoral majority, right? First Corinthians 1 verse 19. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath, God, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Notice what it says here. 
It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It pleases God by the foolishness of preaching. The world's wisdom looks at preaching, looks at the wisdom of God and says that will never work. And man, they sound sophisticated and they sound intelligent and it sounds like they've done their scientific research. But you know, God is the one who created this world and God knows the hearts and minds of men and God knows what he's doing. God is the greatest agent of change in history, folks. He's the greatest agent of change in history. I'm not a Calvinist. But what God has done in history has affected the most change that anyone else ever, ever could. Okay? When Christ came on the planet 2,000 years ago, that changed everything. Right? When God created the nation of Israel 3,000 years ago, that changed everything. When God gave a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that changed everything. Where do you think 2.5 billion people, or more than that, 3, 3 or 4 billion people in the world, get their religion from? That guy. The Abrahamic religions come from him, from God's intervention. There's battles over there about a land that God promised these people. Right? There's whole denominations and whole countries being run by what they think this guy's doing. Christ, right? God is the greatest agent of change. He knows what he's doing, and he's told you to do something, which is preach the cross. And you're going, that's silly. Well, do you believe God or don't you? He's looked at the world and said, it is the world is hopeless in their own devices. The only hope the world has is preaching the cross. I need preachers. And that's where real change is going to happen. We are not going to bring in God's kingdom now. Okay? It's not going to happen. We can get people saved. And we will when we do ministry work. Right? When we preach the gospel. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And people can be saved. They will be saved when you preach the gospel to them. They can't be saved at all when you're preaching politics at them. It doesn't save people. You get another vote, don't get another saved person. Right? The majority of people involved in politics are Catholics as far as Christians. Okay, that's just how it is. You got evangelicals and things as well that operate in it, but and uh, most people who are so focused on the politics as the primary means of change in the world and our country typically are the least the people who, who do the least evangelistic work. Because they truly believe their doctrine affects their behavior. They truly believe that their intervention in politics will affect change greater than what God said to do, seeing souls saved. You see? So what I'm preaching this morning and advocating is God's means of change for individuals, for your family, for the church, for the country, for the world. And that's the gospel. By God's means of salvation, we see people in countries under very oppressive regimes being saved by the gospel written out on a piece of toilet paper. Bibles being floated across the North Korean border on balloons. And we're all scared about nuclear war. And here's a Christian floating a Bible on a balloon and someone gets saved. Wow. If that's a not carnal weapon of warfare, I don't know how you, a balloon? This will change the world? Wow. A nuclear bomb, that'll change the world. Yeah, if they're saved, they'll die and go to heaven. All right? If you preach the gospel of peace, when they nuke you, there'll be an, another whole country formed out of people saying, why'd you nuke those people? They're just preaching peace. All right? That's what happens. Christians often, Christianity often grows during times of persecution. If you're Paul, you pray for a good persecution. How many of us are Pauline, right? Instead, we want things to be better. Right? Who doesn't? We all do. But we're ambassadors first, right? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Almost done here. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. Paul went to Corinth. Jeremy adequately described the city before, wealthy, advanced, astute, wise according to the world. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, Paul says, When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see? Read that and think about politics when you read that. Your wisdom should not stand, or, uh, the power of your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith for the future of your life, the future of the world, the, the, your faith in the truth should not stand in the wisdom of men. Who runs our country? Men. Right? Who operate in churches? Men. Who runs families? Men. <laughs> Don't trust men, folks. 
Trust God's word. The power of God, which is what? The gospel that saves, Romans 1, 16. That will save people. Verse 6 says, We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world. Look at the next four words. That come to not. Not means nothing. He says the princes of this world and the wisdom of this world come to nothing. God's wisdom puts those to shame. And you don't have a PhD. You don't have years and years of experience in politics. Some of you may, I don't know. Right? But if you know the wisdom of the world, those things will be, are nothing compared to the, the God's wisdom. If you have faith in that, and if you've seen change in your own life with that, you know it's true. Okay. I, I get stirred up a little bit about politics. I, it's one of my personal hobby of mine. And so I struggle with this. But I've seen more change in my own life based on God's wisdom than anything I've learned from any sort of political philosopher. So when George Bush says his favorite political philosopher is Jesus Christ, I go beyond that. He's my Lord and Savior. Okay, He is my head. He died on the cross for my sins. Let's see, Far greater change done by that message than any sort of political philosophy. In verse 7 says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world and for our glory. The wisdom that Paul says is greater than the world's wisdom and the princes of this world is the mystery of Christ, folks. The mystery revealed to Paul. That's the greater wisdom. That's why we preach that so often. To change our thinking and the way we think about what God's doing in the world so it can affect our lives. The devil would distract us from this. We're to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. The devil would not make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. We're in a warfare. We need soldiers. So when we come to politics, we'll start answering some of these questions next week as well. Our message is Christ and Him crucified. Our message is let God be true and every man a liar. And I listed here, and I did some research years back about how biblical a doctrine affects your political you know, philosophy and all this. It's all boring stuff. But it's really just God's word. And it's these questions here that when you ask these questions, the Bible gives you answers that when you apply them to the world, it changes the way you view things. Like, what is our ultimate authority? Is it God or man? Well, this is a simple question, simple answer. God is our ultimate authority. I told you, this is what I would ask the presidential candidates. What's your ultimate authority? Do you believe Jesus is God? Okay, if they said no, that would tell me all I need to know about what they're going to do, what they, their goals are, what their means would be. If they said, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is God, that's at least a starting point for me. I would say, great, at least I know what they're accountable to, what they think they're accountable to, if I can trust the words out of their mouth. <laughs> Right? We, our ultimate authority is God, not man. So that means every man, whether it be the husband of your house, whether it be the pastor in your church, whether it be the president of your country, are accountable to God, right? That's how it ought to be. That's biblical doctrine. This is teaching. This is preaching. Christ is the head of all things. How do we view truth? Is truth literal? Is there an absolute truth or is it allegorical? Is it abstract? Well, this is a debate within Christian doctrine. Take the Bible literally, it's going to change the way you view the context of things. Okay? Is there a reason why we're here where we're at right now? Or do events happen in history just randomly out of chance? You know, just there's no reason, no cause and effect. But if you believe the Bible literally, you believe it absolutely true, that means what God said is will happen, will happen, what God says is happening, is happening, and what God says is the cause of things is the cause of things. Sin, righteousness, salvation, right? Or you could just allegorize the whole thing. Sin is really our oppression, and sin, what sin is, when people pay people lower than $15 an hour, that's what sin is, you know. Don't read that one anywhere. You see, this is the conversation that goes back and forth among people who call themselves Christians. How are we saved? Say, what does this have to do with politics? How are you saved? Is it by grace or works? Because if you think it's by grace, then that means you believe that man is inherently evil. And then we need to say by grace, because we can't do it on our own. If you believe you're saved by works, which, by the way, majority of Christianity thinks that you are, those who call themselves Christians, then you'll think that men is inherently good, and that the only thing we need to do to change our world is to get the right institution, the right man in there, some more study on the proper method, and then we'll, we'll get it worked out. Right? But if you know that people are incapable, then we need God's revelation to guide us, to direct us, to tell us. You see the difference? Then we, we don't say, well, you know what? People ought to want to pay their taxes. People ought to want to help the poor. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. We should help the poor. Right? But can we trust people to do it on their own? 
Good question. What is the Corinthian problem once again, right? Under grace, how does grace giving work? As you purpose in your heart. Do people give more or less when they learn grace? They give less. I mean, under the law, they've got to, uh, under fear of punishment, right? Uh, you, you set them free. Under grace, you say you're not required to give anything. It says you purpose in your heart. Well, inevitably, their heart doesn't yet purpose because that's maturity. And so they go, well, all right, well, I won't give. And so you can see how this would affect the way you set up policies, the way you would see how people would respond in the world. The nature of man, how you're saved. What about the future? Is your future secure? Is there a purpose? Do we have hope at all in the future? Not in this world, but we have hope. We have peace. The world teaches hopelessness. The world puts its hope on this election. The world puts its hope on the government, on the politics, on the institutions of society and says, that's our hope. You know, our GDP, our deficit margin, you know, that's the hope. It's not, folks. You have a hope beyond that which doesn't mean we're reckless or anything else, but it just simply means that there's a stability and a strength and a peace that you have by putting on the full armor of God. You can stand against the wiles of the devil, right? Which is of ignorance. Who makes your choices? In, in the church, we talk about Calvinism and free will all the time. And we don't apply it to politics. Do you make a choice, or does God make the choice for you? How does it apply to politics? Well, if you believe the government's God... The collective, right? Maybe we, you can't make the choice. Someone else has got to make the choice for you. Hmm. Who's responsible for your choices? You or someone else? These are doctrinal questions, folks. Are you responsible for your choices or do I answer for you? Right, as the pastor. Well, in the body of Christ today, there is no priest. You answer for yourself. I answer for myself before God. Individual responsibility is a biblical doctrine that you stand before Jesus Christ as the head. So unless someone wants to claim to be Christ on earth, oh, the Pope? How do you think he got away with ruling those countries all those years? I stand in the seat of Christ. I, was, I guess that makes sense. Doctrinally wrong, you say. Doctrine affects it. When we preach Christ crucified, when we preach the Bible rightly divided, we have the tools of change. Okay? It just means we have to learn how to use them and apply them in our world, in our lives, in our families. And people change. Things, uh, change happens. You're evidence of it. I'm evidence of it. Every saved person throughout history is evidence of it. It works. It works for the end of God's goal of establishing a thing called a church, the body of Christ. That's what God's interested in. He is not interested in the world boasting in their ambitions. He's interested in saving people in, in, in the body of Christ. And all men can be saved when they hear the gospel. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. Next week we will talk about uh, elections and if they help us or not. I think it may be our last, year, last lesson next week or the following. Any comments, any questions? All right. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us instruction about what you're doing today, without which we would be lost. We'd be fumbling around and we would be doing the best we would know how, but would no doubt mess things up. And so we thank you, Lord, that you have a purpose, you have an agenda that you have given us privilege to understand. I pray that we would be so equipped in it that we would apply it to how we operate in the world and that we would uh, put our hope in you and not in unsaved humanity. Amen.